Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Legend Iron Man walkthrough of XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. Last time we left off, after destroying an alien relay as part of a Gorilla Ops mission, a mission that did get a bit dicey near the end, but ultimately we pulled off another flawless victory. We also welcomed Grenadier QT Lint to the team, but otherwise we did not really make too much progress in terms of construction, research or the overall questline. So let's hope that today things will be different as we jump into the world map here. We are immediately greeted by another rumor, this one for supplies, but considering that we now collect our monthly supply drop instantly, and that the next supply drop is not too far away, and that we also have enough supplies for the time being, I think, let's skip this one for now and instead finally finish the weapons dealer rumor in Asia. Right, so much for making progress today. Looks like today's mission is here, after barely one minute into the episode. However, we will actually postpone it just for a brief second here. We should not be more than one or two hours away from completing the rumor scan, and while you should definitely not delay too much on retaliation strike missions, a few hours is perfectly acceptable, so despite all the warnings, we'll continue for just a brief moment longer. Strategic resource located. And that rewards us with 42 alien alloys and 41 Illyrium crystals. You should have Alright, so the Hunter is active in this region, but unless I'm mistaken, should not be able to show up on this mission. Still, we will have plenty to deal with, if not with our enemies, then with our squad, and considering that the last mission is just a few hours away, our squad for today consists pretty much of the last reserve. These six here are indeed the last few soldiers with a rank worth mentioning that are not tired or otherwise occupied. It is, for the most part, the same team we brought last time, only Grenadiers Nicholas and Cutie Linda knew. They are replacing Grenadier Typhoon and Reaper Sleeper. So definitely not the best squad to deal with an advent retaliation, but I still think it's better than sending out tired soldiers. Sky Ranger deployed. In position for deployment. We just got word the aliens are attacking a resistance outpost in this region, and they're not taking any prisoners. These people need our help, and we're heading in to make sure the aliens regret coming after the resistance. Neutralize all hostile contacts in the area and secure the camp. Menace 1 5, hostile forces are attacking the outpost. Eliminate all enemy units and protect those civilians. Advent came in hot and so did we. You won't have a concealed position for deployment on this one. Alright, so as always, 13 civilians are on the map and 6 of them we need to rescue. There will also be a few faceless hidden among them and of course plenty of enemies. In the shadows then we can already see the outline of what are hopefully a few civilians, and since Helleborus is the only one with concealment, let's send him up first, which also reveals our first enemies, we are once again dealing with chrysalids. This unit is relatively agile. That means the rest of the squad won't move up too far. Let's see if we can't catch them in an Overwatch ambush. Alright, the two chrysalids move but don't make contact just yet. However, it also looks like they are far from the only ones present on the map, as we spot a grand total of three more here, all burrowing down, so we should definitely keep those spots in mind. Our first civilian then goes down at the hands of an Archon accompanied by a Sectoid, and then something slightly weird happens, as two of the chrysalids who just burrowed down immediately emerge again. And not only that, the second one then actually also makes up quite the distance to catch up with our squad. Keep in mind, up until this point none of the enemies actually knew where we were, so this is definitely some weird behavior. Unfortunately though, I have experienced that a lot with chrysalids. On the bright side though, our overwatchers deal some good damage, and so the chrysalid is left standing with only 3 hit points and also does not get to attack, which is actually something I have seen too in these situations. Yes, chrysalids can absolutely screw you over, and I am mostly convinced that this is not how they are intended to behave. Either way, let's lure in the two here in the back too. Sharpshooter Radonis has a 90% shot, let's see if he can hit it. Right, looks like we're off to a great start here. Well, in that case, let's do it the easy way and send in our Spark Julian. Father really outdid himself, didn't he? 
So after a move that we probably should have made in the first place, we can now send in our new grenadier and have QT drop the first of her four explosives. That leaves the two chrysalids standing with 8 hit points each. Let's send in our heavy gunner Nicholas, who is once again benefiting from both scope and tracer rounds. Unfortunately though, he only deals minimum damage. Let's see if Zucchini can do a better job against the other chrysalid. And he can, which gives us the first kill of the mission. Up next then, we are moving Helleboris and rescue our first civilian. Begebe mich zur Zielposition. Gerettet. Und jetzt Bewegung. And then we take a shot, the stock will guarantee the kill, and stealth unfortunately no longer matters as much with chrysalids on the map. Du warst kein Gegner für mich. Chrysalid number three then can fall to Julian. Once again, the stock damage will be enough for the kill. Alright, and with that, our turn comes to a rather successful end, I would say. Do I get a badge or something? On the enemy turn, then, the third and last burrowed chrysalid emerges, and unfortunately it kills a civilian, which has a nasty side effect that we will see in just a moment. For the time being, though, let's move up with our spark. I'll comply for now. From here on out, Julian will be our scout, just on the off chance that another chrysalid somehow emerges from somewhere, because Julian is quite heavily armored and also immune to their poison. At the moment though, it looks like the coast is clear, so most of the squad can spend the turn dashing, and those who did not can end things on Overwatch. I'm on it. Overwatch engage. On the enemy turn then, the Archon takes aim at another civilian, but thankfully misses. Meanwhile, we can see what happens if a unit is killed by a chrysalid. The victim turns into a rather gruesome chrysalid cocoon, which will then spawn up to three new baby chrysalids, one per turn. So, one more reason to end things rather quickly here. And as Julian climbs onto the high ground here, we activate the Archon pod. And he also spots another chrysalid that has seemingly moved already, or simply does not want to. So, let's engage. Both Rodonis and Grenadier Nicholas can quickly follow Julian's footsteps. And Nicholas will begin by laying down fire and with that holo targeting on the Archon. That deals 7 points of damage, gives Nicholas an ability point and we can now activate Overdrive on Julian, so that we now have two actions left after moving instead of just one. With that first action then, we'll aim a rocket, which is always a bit finicky, but we can target at least the chrysalid, which strikes me as the higher priority target compared to the sectoid. His shot then meanwhile goes against the Archon, 96%, let's hope he can make it count. Alright, max damage. So far, Julian's definitely looking better than last time. Let's move up Specialist Zucchini next, who also has a very high percentage shot. Now it's not quite enough for the kill, but as you know, three hit points, we can deal with that. So let's have Sharpshooter Radonis focus on the Chrysalid next. Only 6 damage, leaving that one standing at 3 hit points too. So I think it's time for another explosive. And unfortunately, there will likely also be a civilian casualty this time, as we are looking to fire QT's rocket now to blow up the car. And as you can see, we will also catch the Archon in the blast radius. Ready for the fireworks! Okay, Archon down, the car remains miraculously intact however, which unfortunately then also goes for the sectoid. And even though we could go for the kill with the axe throw here, let's not do that. 76% is not the best hit chance and there might be better opportunities. After all, sectoids make a good case for the least threatening enemies in the entire game. So instead, we'll use the powers of our stock to take out the chrysalid. And with that, our turn comes to an end. On the enemy turn, then it is revealed that the chrysalid we just killed was apparently not on its own, and the one emerging from the shadows has its sights set on another civilian. 
So that means we now have two active chrysalid cocoons on the map, not to mention this lovely pot of enemies over here, consisting of what looks to be a trooper, a shield bearer and an elite mech. They are also killing the second civilian on this turn, making up for the Archon's miss earlier. Meanwhile, with that Archon already taken out and the sectoid injured, it now goes for the retreat and will most likely come back later. The chrysalid up top then spawns a second baby chrysalid and is then destroyed, but still that's two enemies more than what we would regularly have to deal with. One of those baby chrysalids then also burrows down, which means our next move up here will once again be taken by Julian. I'm as graceful as a gazelle. And instead of rescuing a civilian, he reveals a faceless, of course he does. Well, at least he does not activate any further enemies. And the faceless is then actually also easily dealt with. First, Julian can punch it. Then we have Nicholas take aim at the chrysalid further in the back. Specialist Zucchini can then move up onto the high ground and deal the killing blow. And sharpshooter Radonis does not need more than a pistol shot to take care of the faceless. Target eliminated. And that also gets him the promotion to lieutenant. Lovely. Grenadier QT then moves up too and thankfully does not reveal another one. I got you. Go. And in what was potentially a somewhat risky move, Helleborus does the same. Our ranger then also goes on overwatch to end our turn. Let's see what we have coming our way. Alright, looks like that part with the heavy mech is even more dangerous than we thought, as it includes a second heavy mech, this one though thankfully only with 9 hit points and 2 points of armor. On the right side, Helleborus' overwatch shot connects and removes 6 hit points from the elite version, although immediately following that things take a turn for the worse again, as two advent troopers decide that now is the right time to join the fight. And of course, the injured sectoid from earlier makes a timely appearance as well, not to mention another chrysalid now emerging from its cocoon. A second one has also burrowed down, so that makes two now, so we should be careful if and how we move. Still, our top priority should most likely be the eight enemies we are currently engaged with. Good thing that Grenadier QT has a few explosives still left, as I think this situation right here definitely calls for a grenade. Now, unfortunately, aiming this was pretty tricky and I wanted to make sure to at least hit the heavy mech in the front, so I'm not really sure if this will actually do damage to the shield bearer and trooper on the first floor. At the very least, though, it will blow out the floor from underneath them. Take this. Okay, so unfortunately no damage to trooper and shield bearer, but the sectoid is down, and overall our enemies look a little bit more exposed now. Let's make use of that with Nicholas, who unfortunately needs to drop down to target the shield bearer, but even without the high ground he's got a 93 percenter. And he even gets the critical hits, leaving the shield bearer standing with 3 hit points, which now makes it the perfect target to use Helleborus' axe throw, which in this case is guaranteed to hit and kill. Another crit then for good measure, but it doesn't really help us much, so instead let us now target the robots, and thankfully both Radonis and Zucchini have blue screen rounds equipped, which means Luna Radonis can take care of the mech on top, and Zucchini of the one down below. Now at this point, I think the unfortunate moment has come that we send out Julian, As you wish. which is most likely going to trigger a chrysalid burrow ambush. And indeed, a young chrysalid emerges and targets our spark, however, the claw attack thankfully misses. Still, as you can see, Julian is now surrounded by five enemies, although thanks to his superior stock we are guaranteed to make that three in a moment, as the injured trooper here will go down guaranteed. Efficiency is my speciality. 
Nonetheless, this leaves four more enemies, two troopers and two chrysalids, and even though Julian is heavily armored and I really have no issue with him taking a few points of damage here and there, all of this here might just be a bit too much, so I think it's Mimic Beacon time. Let's see if our enemies fall for the trap. Alright, the first trooper moves in and takes aim at the beacon and also deals six points of damage. A second hit like that and the beacon will already be gone. And it looks like trooper number two here has the same idea, but luckily only deals five points of damage, so our mimic beacon lives on to take another attack. That one then at the hands of a chrysalid, and once again it misses, so I guess I know who I'm adding to the MVP poll today. More chrysalids then emerge, but thankfully they do not get to act just yet. Meanwhile, the last one engaged with our troops does, and even though it hits and also crits the Mimic Beacon, we don't care about that, as we have just successfully managed to somehow avoid taking any damage whatsoever. Right, so here we are, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 enemies are closing in on our spark, and since this is once again a situation calling for explosives, let's get Julian out of the way first. Up on the roof here, he even has some high ground, as Grenadier QT fires her last grenade. Throwing grenade! This does not give us any kills, but it makes the situation look much more manageable. And to make it even more so, Nicholas can now use one of his explosives as well. Let's give our heavy gunner four easy kills here. Boom! Targets eliminated. And just like that, there were only two. The trooper, an easy target for specialist zucchini. And the chrysalids, a not so easy but still guaranteed kill for Helleborus. And with the camera briefly shifting and the sounds of an emerging faceless appearing, we have confirmation. Seems to me like we just dealt with the last remaining enemies on the map. The only one left at this point is the second faceless, and we have the luxury of being able to end our turn with two soldiers on Overwatch. Scanning. Sounds like a job for a turret. And indeed, on the enemy turn, the faceless then appears and triggers reaction fire, first from sharpshooter Luna Radonis, who uncharacteristically of him actually misses the shot. Let's see what Julian can do, as the faceless here is seemingly moving in to strike him. Alright, that connected, the Faceless is left standing at 4 hit points, and I think our Spark has earned the right to take care of this. Will the death of this Minus one change five, anything? Status confirmed. We're not picking up any additional contacts. The AO is clear. Status confirmed. Mission accomplished. Alright, there we are, a flawless retaliation mission with 9 rescued civilians. Considering the squad we sent out on this one, that was definitely unexpected. And yes, we did get a bit lucky with the Mimic Beacon near the end, but to be honest I don't think that changed too much regarding the mission outcome. Sure, Julian might have taken a hit or two, but I have to say, overall things went extremely well here today. We must never doubt the depths to which our enemy will sink in their misguided beliefs. Today's cruel ambush of Advent Outreach Squads again proves that we can no longer tolerate XCOM's commitment to the violence and cruelty of the old world. I'm glad to see our troops finding success in the field. It's good for the entire crew's morale. Alright, here we are. At this point everyone but QT is tired as well. So let's hope that the next mission is not waiting for us right around the corner. We also have to promote Sharpshooter Redonis, and I think I have mentioned this before. We are building him up to become a pure sniper, so he receives death from above, even though I personally think that quickdraw is the better ability in most cases. 
In terms of loot then, nothing out of the ordinary, but 9 rescued civilians, that is respectable. And it will now also increase the regional income in Eastern Europe by 27 supplies. You have done an outstanding job leading the resistance, Commander. Understandably then, the Council very happy with our performance, and I imagine you would not be too happy with me if we now make the cut. So let's continue scanning for just a little while longer, we have a few interesting things on the horizon, and I would like to make at least a little bit of progress here before we wrap things up. Our rumor then, 8 days for some intel, interesting but nothing we'll take just yet. Instead, now that we have the capacity, let's make contact with New India. The Asian continent bonus will allow us to complete experimental ammo projects instantly, and I think that is very much desirable. We've utilized all of our available communications capacity. We can't establish any new contacts until we upgrade our systems. We've managed to track the chosen hunter to this region. So, nine regions have been brought into the fold, so that leaves only seven more. The hunter also controls this one, but hopefully not for that much longer. For the time being then, let's head back to the skirmish HQ. I have to admit, I'm really not too interested in any of the rumors at the moment. Alright, we have unlocked our very first experimental heavy weapon, the Shredder Gun. Of the two heavy weapons remaining in this project, this is in my opinion clearly the better one. We'll see it in action soon enough, but basically it is an area of effect armor piercing gun, capable of hitting multiple enemies with a decent damage output. And even though I believe it is the better one, we are hoping to unlock the other one too, just for an achievement. So let's begin working on the next experimental heavy weapon. Like I said, eventually we will need them all. We'll get started right away, Commander. I'll send word when the project is complete. And just as a side note, for another achievement we also still need to build ourselves at least two more sparks, but those are expensive and we need to save some funds for what comes next. Another important step forward in our research. And yes, this here is what we have been saving for. We have now ascended to the highest tier of weaponry. Plasma weapons are here. Let's take a closer look at them. The aliens aren't going to be happy when they see we've got energy weapons just like theirs now. And yes indeed, reaching a new tier of weaponry of course unlocks plenty of new weapons and research projects. Immediately available to us at this point are now the plasma weapon upgrades to the Templar Auto Pistol, the Skirmisher Bullpup, the regular pistol, as well as of course the Plasma Assault Rifle. The rest will need to be unlocked with specific research projects. We are also informed that the interchangeable upgrades breakthrough has been applied, but that has been the case for several episodes now, so much more exciting is this one here. The beam cannon project, the weapon for the grenadier, has been inspired, so we will most likely get started on that soon. But first, it looks like we have collected enough shield bearer corpses for the autopsy to now be instant, so let's take care of that first. Physically, the Advent shield bearers are quite similar to the bulk of Advent's forces and that they are the product of careful genetic engineering that generally mirrors the human form. Most of their unique qualities come from a difference in equipment and armor. Components I'm sure Shen would have an interest in examining. These shield bearers are not all that dissimilar from their various advent peers. Their armor is perhaps the most distinctive feature differentiating them. And so it is no surprise that this autopsy unlocks an armor-related project. Yes, alongside ammo, weapons and grenades, we can also unlock experimental armors in the Proving Ground, and there are definitely a few interesting ones among them. For the moment though, the Proving Ground is busy, and so should be our researchers. So let's queue up the beam cannon, the inspiration here only takes away two days from its research time, but still, that's two days we save on a weapon that we want to unlock as quickly as we can anyway. The science is eager to begin, Commander. Alright, and there we are, with plasma weapons unlocked, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut in today's episode. Next time then, you can see it on the bottom right of your screen, we will have our first Psy operatives ready to go. Our squad will also hopefully get a few more days of rest before the next mission appears, a mission that will then feature plasma weapons for the very first time. So stay tuned for that, and in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. 
As always, if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Peat Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.